let me uh, let me get rolling with just some housekeeping and intro uh, for everything. So this is an FEI Financial Executives International uh, hosted event, which we are a wonderful CFO network, CPE accredited events that focuses on bringing finance and accounting and, and leaders together to discuss different things from hosting different companies to different ideas. Um, most recently, we hosted Under Armour to talk about work culture and get involved in how they structure their finance and accounting uh, functions and how they do it well and what, what their premises are. Um, we've hosted multiple other ones that focus on actual businesses from, from uh, you know, uh, small boutique manufacturers to large corporations from you know international marketing companies. So if you ever have a company that wants to be spotlighted and talk about the uh, growth and success that they're having, um, you know, please reach out. Um, you know, it's a wonderful network of CFOs. Secondly, um, co-hosting is, uh, you know, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan Baltimore, which has been a great partner with FEI on multiple of these events. And uh, we recently had a, a great uh, addition to the family for Boys and Girls Club. I've sat on their board for five years. I think this is just showing the progress and the uh, amazing work that we're doing for Baltimore City's youth. Um, but we've hired uh, Amber Reed, which I hope Amber's here. I didn't, I didn't see if she's in there but, um, or in yet, but uh, she is going to be the Director of Social and Emotional Wellness for the Boys and Girls Club and for our clubs. Um, this is just to elevate our clubs one more level, work with the club staff to, to deliver on um, giving these children a chance to, to be even more happy and more well. Um, Amber, are you there? Morning, I am. How are how's everybody doing? Doing well. Um, you know, welcome to to our team at the Boys and Girls Club. If you don't mind, you know, what's what's most exciting to you? What what's been uh what's been the first week like? First week, I am excited to be here. I'm excited to, you know, provide social and emotional wellness for the youth that they we serve and the families, but also the staff. And I think that's important. Um, the human service field is very, um, can be tiring um, and it's a high turnover rate. Um, so sometimes we forget to check in on our staff. Um, a lot of what our youth go through and experience is trauma and staff can experience secondary trauma. Um, so just ensuring that we are taking care of not only the youth's needs and the family's needs, but our staff needs. Um, so that is where I am coming in and trying to work towards making sure everybody's uh, social and emotional wellness is okay. I love it. Um, no, thank you so much. And honestly, thanks for being a part of this. It was so timely. Your first week on the job and we're having a, a discussion on positive psychology and well-being. And that's that's your forte. So really excited to have you at this event, but then also uh, immensely excited for you to be a part of our team to, to develop and help the Baltimore City youth. Um, so thank you for being here. And thank you to Jesse Schaefer, our, um, our uh, resource development director, um, for participating in this. Um, just to go over some housekeeping of the, the, the way FEI events are, are structured, um, Corinne Neese from Arundel Psychological Associates is going to go through a, a, a brief presentation. We're going to have two breakout rooms where we're going to get together and brainstorm on different different concepts, which which um, Corinne will go through. FEI also does different polling questions to get different uh, data points and, and KPIs on the uh, on the events. So throughout the event, Corinne will have different pop up questions come on where you'll be asked to, to answer. So answer the poll polling questions. You get about, I think, 10 seconds, 20 seconds to answer the question. Um, and just look out for those because that's how you'll be eligible for the CPE credit uh, of the event. Um, so I want to introduce Corinne Neese. She works for Arundel Psychological Associates. Um, you know, C C Corinne is kind enough to dedicate a lot of time to structuring this, this event for us to talk about uh, positive psychology in the workplace. I'll tell you from the research that I've done, the themes of positive psychology are so exciting, or at least they're so relevant to, I think, daily life and how to conceptualize how to go into a work day. Um, the idea of developing relationships and finding your strengths and focusing on your strengths, finding meaning in life as well as work. Um, that to me seems like a, a, a big theme of this, um, you know, understanding gratitude and flow of when you feel like you're in a good flow. What does that mean? Um, but I'll let Corinne, the expert, talk about this. I'm very excited to have you here, Corinne. 
Thank you so much, John. I am so excited to be here. Oh, just oh no, the thing is there. To be able to share my passion for positive psychology. Um, this is something that I've been incredibly passionate about for about the last decade. Um, and it's something that I taught as a graduate teaching assistant at Columbia University, where I worked with a lot of really passionate kids who also loved positive psychology. So I think this is something that can be applied more broadly than it is now. So I think this is something that's incredibly important, especially among really, say, high intensity work environments, where a lot of times it's about achievement, the grind, working long hours. And a lot of times we don't take a step back to focus on our well being. And well being is so incredibly important. And I think, you know, I really appreciate having the time to just share about this today. So, to get started, yeah give you some of the topics of what we're going to cover. So first we're going to go into just what is positive psychology? Where did it come from? Really, what is happiness? Because there's a lot of research in, you know, what is happiness? What does that look like? How do we measure it? Then we'll go into some different specific work workplace interventions. So these are things like John was saying, mindfulness, flow, character strengths, gratitude, and different ways that we can implement this in our lives. Then after part one, we'll have the breakout group. It'll be about 10 minutes. And then that's where I want you all to brainstorm about how to apply this to your workplace. So if we think about, you know, we all are coming from different backgrounds. A lot of us are in the financial industry, a lot of financial executives, accountants, people working in finance. We also have individuals working in PR, working in sales, working in uh, therapists, just like myself. <laughs> Um, so I think it'd be great to get a lot of different perspectives. Part two, we'll go into some clinical psychology interventions, which include cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and this is something that can be used, you know, not only just in your therapy office, but also by yourself. So I'll be teaching you just basic principles about cognitive behavioral therapy so you can use them in your daily life how to reframe different, say, challenging things that are happening into growth opportunities. Um, and then we'll have another breakout room and then we'll have some self-care planning and creating SMART goals. So SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. But I will go into this much further into the presentation. So to start today, what do you hope to learn during today's presentation? So there should be a polling question that pops up um, and then we can review the results of what you hope to learn. So do you hope to increase your satisfaction at work? Do you hope to become happier and more optimistic to create a positive workplace for culture or all of these things? So we'll give you about 30 seconds to answer. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of really optimistic people, all of the above, which is very exciting to see. All right, so we've got most people saying all of the above, so I am happy to see that. I think all of the other ones, great answers too, very important, how to be more satisfied, more happy, optimistic. And I think creating a culture is really important too, as we have a lot of executives here. So how to implement these for your employees. So do I click, John, do I click share results? Let's see. Denise, you got that? All right, Denise, yeah. that's perfect, thank you. And then we can just um, close the box if it doesn't close automatically. Just click in the upper right-hand corner. Perfect, thank you. All right. So we'll move into where positive psychology came from. So it was really a growth out of the humanistic movement of the 1960s. So you'll see these really important figures on the screen, Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. There were a ton of researchers involved in this, but Maslow and Rogers were really some of the most important and some of my favorite psychologists. Um, if you've probably seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs in some sort of intro business course at some point in your life. Um, but what it's saying is essentially, shifting the perspective from pathology to growth. So how do we become our most actualized self? 
what you see at this pyramid starts with the basic needs and then it builds up to belongingness, esteem, and self-actualization. And ultimately, I want you all to become your most actualizing selves. And I hope to give you some ways to make that possible in the workplace. So a little background on positive psychology. So this was something that was coined by uh, Martin E. Seligman. And he kind of, you know, took what the humanistic movement was doing and kind of ran with that. So success does not precede happiness, happiness precedes success. So I imagine we all want to be successful and in order to really be successful and have this full meaningful life and career, we gotta be happy, right? But then there's also the issue of striving for happiness and pushing to try to be happy so badly. Positive psychology doesn't mean not reflecting on maybe some of the negative aspects, right? That life is hard validate that sometimes things are really challenging, but then implement some of the practices that we talk about today in order to be able to create the happiest life. So it's more of a choice. The things we do every single day, which are some of these practices, can actually make us more happy in our career. It's a switch to focusing on strengths rather than pathology. So for a long time, the field of psychology focused on, you know, you're depressed and anxious, what are your symptoms? How do we fix these symptoms? And instead, we like to focus on, you know, fix the symptoms, but also what are you good at and how can we build upon what you're already good at rather than looking at the lower areas? Say, if you're already a leader, how do we use that? If you're already someone who is really humorous, that's a big strength. How do we use that in the workplace? Also choosing a growth orientation over a deficit orientation. So a growth orientation would be, say you have a really challenging task coming up at work and you're feeling really overwhelmed and you could frame this as, you know, I'm in over my head and there's no way I can do this and I'm so angry that I have to do this assignment. Instead, you could shift it to an orientation of, this is a way for me to challenge myself. This is a way for me to grow. And while it might be hard, I have the opportunity to grow through this. And really, I want you to think about, are you thriving or are you merely surviving? Because a lot of us live in a state of just surviving. And I think it's important to reflect on whether we're really thriving in our life or we're just getting by. And this is one of my favorite quotes, Carl Rogers, the good life is a process, not a state of being. So how we apply this is active things every day that you do to create the life that's worth living. So the PERMA theory of well-being, this was created by Martin Seligman. And the acronym stands for positive emotions, engagement, relationships, and meaning and accomplishment. So all of these things are incredibly important in the workplace and they can all be applied in the workplace. So positive emotions, increasing positive emotions result in more productivity, creativity, innovation. It's something that is probably not focused on so much in a lot of work cultures. Engagement, experiencing enjoyment and flow in your work. So I don't know if any of you have heard of flow before and research by, uh, it's Mihai, uh, McCheck Mihai. Uh, it's a researcher, I don't wanna butcher his name, um, but does research in flow and about being in that optimal state of focus and engagement. So for instance, when you're playing an instrument, when you're just so fully immersed in a project that time passes and you don't even realize time is passing. That's what we want to try to uh, optimize and create the most of. Relationships are the number one predictor for well being. And living in this um, COVID age of a lot of Zoom calls and maybe some less connection, we need to be innovative about the ways that we, you know, connect with people, create Zoom events where you talk to people. So hint, hint later, let's try and talk in these groups and get a little connection going. <laughs> Meaning, finding a sense of purpose in your work. So we can find purpose in our work and we can find purpose at our work. So when we find it in our work, like for me, you know, I work with adolescents and adults who, you know, I help reach their full potential and that feels incredibly meaningful to me. For someone here, you could be providing a necessary service and really helping the lives of others. 
You can also find purpose at work by saying how you helped out a colleague, how you feel connection to the people you're around, and also accomplishment. Setting realistic goals allow us to flourish. So you want to be able to set goals that you can reach so you can get that little uh, that little hit of dopamine, right? Every time that we, which is a, a neurotransmitter in the brain that gets signaled when we reach a goal or when we do something to accomplish. So how can we increase positive psychology through practices? So here's the application of these positive psychology principles. So gratitude, mindfulness, compassion, and self-compassion truly might be surprising flow, character strengths, positive reframing, finding meaning, and human connection. So we'll start with my favorite, which is gratitude. And gratitude is something that it increases positive emotions, promotes health, and increases happiness. There's so much research backing the importance of gratitude practices. And I know that this might be a little touchy-feely. I know a lot of you might be thinking, you know, just saying what you're grateful for sounds a little, you know, touchy feely, too, too mushy gushy for me. But the research shows that this works. So why not give it a try? The three good things daily practice can be directly applied to the workplace. So in a broader sense, you would write three good things that happened at the end of the day. But if you're trying to incorporate this into making yourself feel more satisfied with your work, at the end of the day, writing three good things that happened about work. So this could be, I was really grateful that Sarah stayed back to help me with a spreadsheet. I was really grateful that my boss was kind to me when I made a mistake. So things as simple as that, or I was really grateful that there was some good coffee in the office today. We can also have different innovative applications at work as well, meaning executive, People, people higher up can also set it as an agenda item in meetings. So say in the beginning of a meeting, you can say, all right, let's list our appreciations. Everyone write down two to three appreciations they have this morning before we even get started. And that can just set a precedent of happiness and productivity and making people feel more grounded and connected. There can also be gratitude nominations and shout outs, such as, you know, I really appreciated so-and-so for the way that they went above and beyond in their work. And also leading by example. For a lot of leaders in this, because I know we have a lot of executives here, lead by example through demonstrating your gratitude for your workers, because it's something that is truly appreciated. And when people feel appreciated, they feel more connected, engaged, and motivated. So mindfulness is the next intervention. So John Kabat-Zinn is um, a really important person who brought mindfulness to the West. And the way he describes mindfulness is paying attention in the present moment on purpose and non-judgmentally. So we can be mindful at any time. So if we're going throughout our work day, say right now we're sitting on our computer working, we're sitting in our pajamas, paying attention to the actions we're taking, right? Is what we're doing helping us or is it making us feel more tired? Is it making us feel more sluggish and not engaged? Meditation is a huge way to increase mindfulness. And I don't know, if, you know, maybe some of you have tried meditation and maybe some, some of you have rolled your eyes at meditation, um, but I find it to be something that the research consistently shows it decreases stress, increases attention and positive feelings it decreases even chronic pain. It increases your capacity for compassion. So compassion for your workers and just a general sense of calm. And I imagine a lot of us are probably really stressed and can use a little bit, a dose of calm in their life. So later we'll, I'll actually be guiding you in a quick meditation. So we'll get to even try it out. Dispositional mindfulness is awareness during the day. So not during meditation, it's awareness of thoughts, feelings, sensations, and behaviors during the workday. The benefits are immense. We can really appreciate our career more if we're paying attention to what we're doing, why we're doing it, and doing it with intention, rather than just mindlessly going through the motions. It increases attention and productivity, right? 
if we're not zoning out and thinking about something else, we're productive, we're engaged, we're thinking about what's going on. Also, the ability to reflect on your emotional state will influence your work. So for instance, say you are having a call with a consumer and you are feeling incredibly tense, you're getting angry at this consumer, you're feeling overwhelmed. Is this going to impact the way that you interact with them? Right? And is this going to be ultimately a good call or a bad call? And is it going to lead to the result that you want? So by paying attention to your feelings, you can note, okay, I'm, I'm feeling angry right now. I'm feeling a little on edge. And then finding ways to bring yourself back down and calm yourself so that you don't interact in a way that you wouldn't want to by snapping at a consumer, by being, uh, you know, not not uh, interacting in the way you ideally would like to. Also with that increased interpersonal effectiveness and better communication with consumers and colleagues. And I think we could all benefit from better communication in the workplace. Mindfulness can also be used during stressful times. So I could imagine being all high achieving individuals, people who really like to push themselves, work hard, we get stressed out. And sometimes we might suppress that. Has anyone here ever felt, I can't have this feeling right now, I have to get this work done, and then just kind of pushed your own feeling away? I think we're probably all guilty of this at some point in our lives. So mindfulness during stressful times is really, really important to bring out ourselves back in order to be, say, even more productive than we already were. So first what you do is you say, this is a moment of suffering. And that would be mindfulness. Suffering is an inevitable part of life. Say you're frustrated with your boss, frustrated with your employee, frustrated with really anything that's going on at work. You could say, this is stress. Then remember that everyone feels stress. That's the common humanity. Say that other people feel this way too. I'm not alone and we all struggle. In doing so, it helps you validate your feeling and it actually gives the feeling a lot less power over you. Next, extend kindness to yourself. That's self-compassion. And I know I might be saying self-compassion might make some of you cringe and say that's a little too mushy for me, but it is something that does have a lot of research behind it to make you a more grounded person, a more productive person, and even better leaders. Compassionate leaders are great leaders. So say things like, May I be strong? May I be patient? So now we have question two. Mindfulness is being detail-oriented, a state of daydreaming, paying attention in the present moment non-judgmentally, or only achievable during meditation. So I'll give you all about 30 seconds to finish this question. All right, and it's looking like a lot of you know mindfulness. We've got 96% of you answering, paying attention in the present moment non-judgmentally, which is exactly what mindfulness is. Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> so compassion can be used as a managerial strategy. So in positive psychology, we really emphasize the importance of empathy and compassion. And research demonstrates that actually inciting fear and punishing workers has been found to be highly counterproductive. So when we increase stress levels in a workplace, it's going to make people reduce their creativity and compromise their reasoning abilities. So if we all take a second to think about when are we most productive? Is it when our brain is just scattered and we're incredibly stressed out, not feeling okay? Or is it when we're feeling supported, calm, content, like someone really cares about what we're doing? So I would say compassion is probably one of the strongest things or the best things that we can do as a leader. The benefits of compassionate leadership include lower stress levels, which allow for clearer thinking, the increased capacity for innovation and creativity, 
So with a calmer mind, people can reach that state of flow much more easily, a lot more loyalty and trust. And, you know, in, in careers like this, there can be a lot of turnover. There can be a lot of burnout. But if you have that loyalty and trust, that can help keep retention of employees. There's fewer sick days that come with individuals in a compassionate environment. There's decreased turnover, as I had mentioned, and increased engagement and productivity. So let's try to be a little bit kinder. So if we want to be kinder, something we don't really think about is self-compassion because self-compassion precedes compassion for others. Meaning if we're not kind to ourselves, if we don't use that as our own example, it's pretty hard to be compassionate to others in a really authentic way. And if I were to be asking you, are you hard on yourself? I'm willing to bet that pretty much 100% of us are going to say, yes, I am hard on myself. Why do you think it would be challenging to be kind to yourself? There's a lot of reasons that might go into that, which could be your culture, your upbringing, desire for control, especially for a lot of uh, us high achieving people, maybe you'll lose your edge, right? So I want you to kind of reflect on why it's hard to be kind to yourself because that is something that is incredibly important when it comes to being a good leader, being a grounded leader, being able to be compassionate, take something that someone does wrong, turn it into an opportunity for growth. So mindfulness and compassion actually go hand in hand. So we're getting a little touchy-feely right now and I recognize this. So research-backed loving kindness meditation has been found to increase the capacity for empathy and compassion, increase positive emotions, decrease even chronic pain and migraines, reduce biases towards others, and curb self-criticism, which I think we could all use a little bit of that. So later in this, after our first breakout group, we'll be doing a practice loving kindness meditation. And I know a lot of you may not want to try that because saying loving kindness might make you cringe too but it's something that is worth a try. And there's a lot of research to suggest that there is so much good that comes with it. So just let's keep an open mind today. I promise this stuff will help if you implement it. Flow. So here you can see a picture of Yo-Yo Ma. Um, he's a famous cellist, clearly in a state of flow. So this is a great example of being fully immersed in an activity. This research on flow is done by, I don't want to butcher his name, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And he researched the creativity and productivity of people in the state of flow. And it's been found that if we deliberately enter the state as often as possible, that we will be able to increase our levels of creativity, productivity, engagement, fulfillment. So examples would be like playing the cello, but also this could be if you're really engaged in your work, right? When time flies so quickly, you don't even know that it's passing. Creating a workplace that's conducive for flow is also incredibly important because you want your workers to have every opportunity to be able to enter flow. So setting clear, well-defined goals. So if people know what to expect, they're going to feel more comfortable. They're going to know that what they're doing they're working towards the specific goal. Communicate feedback, of course, very important. Matching strengths to tasks. So this is a huge one that I think is undervalued sometimes. Everyone has their own unique strengths. Every person is their own unique individual with a ton of strengths and a ton of you know, things that make them unique and useful to the workplace. So when we're matching a strength to a task, it creates an environment where you can uh, induce flow. I'm also reducing micromanaging. Have a little bit of trust in your employees, set the goals for them and let them go. Let them work on this and then give them feedback about it. Micromanaging makes them feel like they can't get into this kind of you know, immersion state. So this is a good, oh, here we go. Optimal conditions for flow. So I really love this graph because it helps us understand where the optimal state is. So you'll see on the, on the left side, we have skill. 
And then on the other axis, we have difficulty. So what we want to do is to find that optimal place between skill and difficulty. If the difficulty is too high and the skill is too low, your employees will be anxious, overwhelmed, stressed, and they will not be able to perform optimally. If their skill is too high and the difficulty is too low, then your employees are not going to be able to feel fulfilled. They're going to be bored. So we want to have enough difficulty and enough skill to get to this state of flow where we feel fully immersed in what we're doing. So character strengths. This is one that I love, and I hope that you all will take this character strengths inventory after this. So the VIA character strengths, which is called Virtues in Action, um, they created, based on research, 24 different character strengths that emerged among people. So in the next slide, we'll talk about what those are. So the deploy deployment of these character strengths at work leads to job satisfaction and meaning. So when we're at work, a job is created for an individual, but it's important to be able to, you know, have communication with your boss in order to apply your strengths in an appropriate way. If you find that the intersection, oh right, oh, if we can find the intersection between skills, interests, values, and strengths, you're likely to build a team rich with internal motivation, engagement, and connection. So instead of focusing on so-and-so is not very good at this, how about we focus on what they are good at and how do we build upon that? So here's a list of the character strengths. So I'd like everyone to just take a look at this list. I want you to look at them, think about what you might be strong in. So it's broken down into categories. So we've got the cognitive strengths, creativity, curiosity, judgment, love of learning, perspective, emotional strengths, bravery, perseverance, interpersonal strengths, love, kindness, social intelligence, justice, teamwork, fairness, leadership. We have temperance, like forgiveness. And we have transcendence, like gratitude, hope, the appreciation of beauty and excellence. So when we look at this list, we probably get a sense for what we're good at. And that might vary immensely from the person next to us. So it's important to really think about what are our strengths. And like in the last slide, you can go to www.viacharacter.org in order to take the inventory. Should be a pretty quick inventory and it's something where you can just get your strengths. And this is something that executives can do, managers can do for your employees. Say, I'd like you to take this and bring in your strengths and I'd like to discuss them. Positive reframing. So this is one of the most important parts of positive psychology. So it's our ability to reframe something as a growth opportunity rather than uh, something to complain about. So we highlight the possibilities of challenging workplace tasks rather than complaining and ruminating on something that is just draining our energy. So as human beings, we have what is called a negativity bias. And a negativity bias is something that refers to our proclivity to attend to negative information far more than positive information. So in essence, we're just scanning the world for bad. And this was important in human evolution because at times we did need to scan the world for bad. Are we going to be eaten by a bear? Is there some sort of threat, right? So we're constantly, we're scanning the world, we're trying to make sure, keep ourselves safe. Except now we think, scanning the world for something, and then responding as if there is a bear there, right? Our fear response goes off and we say, oh no, it's, I'm feeling so overwhelmed because it feels as though there's a bear in front of me when it's actually just social rejection or when it's actually just a challenging task. So if we can reframe our negativity bias, if we can work towards seeing the positive, we can actually feel more positive. But this takes effort. It's not something that's just natural and happens to come because we naturally are negative, but we have the ability to be positive. We'll also go into cognitive behavioral therapy a bit more later, which 
is a really good way to reframe, a really good way to look at the evidence of what is real and what is not real and what is your potential. So for question three, positive reframing in your occupation includes all except ignoring your emotional experience, highlighting the possibilities of challenging tasks, focusing on personal growth, changing previous negative perceptions. So it's all of these except one. All right. So it looks like we've got some geniuses here. Yes, good job. So we do not want to ignore our emotional experience, but I get the sense, the sense that this is something that people do often. But I think that it's really important to highlight that we cannot ignore our emotional experience if we want to be honest with ourselves and we want to be positive. We can say, this is a challenging task for me and it is stressful, but this is truly an opportunity for me to grow. Next, finding meaning at work. This is one that is really crucial and it is one that can take some effort to find and to curate and it helps to talk about it. So earlier I mentioned finding meaning in your work and finding meaning at your work. So finding meaning in your work, this is a sense that the job contributes to the greater good, but you don't have to be a, a therapist. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a firefighter to have work that contributes to the greater good because there's so many ways that all of these necessary things that we provide to society create a better environment for individuals, communities, organizations. You can also find meaning at your work. So this is a sense that one is helping others to contribute and reach goals. So for people in positions of leadership, this is something where you can really help your individuals reach goals. And it's something that can feel incredibly meaningful. Do you like being a mentor to people? Do you like helping them strive for achievement? Do you like seeing them reach their goals? And does that give you excitement? We can use the power of perspective to find ways that our actions are meaningful. So we could go throughout our days saying, what I do doesn't matter in the world and this isn't important. Or we can choose to find the ways that it is important. We can push away our negativity bias and we can say, how am I doing this or what I am doing this thing that is important to other people. So an example would be helping a colleague, providing a necessary service, bringing peers together, creating a supportive work culture or encouraging employees. So all of these things are incredibly important. They're both meaning in your work and be both meaning at your work. The organizational psychologist Adam Grant talks about the research about connecting employees to meaning. So job crafting. This is something where it's not saying, you know, you can do whatever you want, but it's saying recognize your strengths and figure out how you can apply these to your job. And to be open with your either boss or your employees about how you can craft your job in a way so that the duties match your strengths. Finally, one of the most, most important things in workplace happiness is investing in relationships. This is the number one predictor to feeling fulfilled, positive emotions, well-being. And it's something that in the age of coronavirus, a lot of us might be lacking and it might be hard to feel that connection. So we really need to be innovative in the ways that we are connecting. So, right, Zoom calls where you actually talk to people change the culture, switch your camera on. I know it can be annoying sometimes, but it's something that is important for your well-being. And even for those of us that are more introverted, we're social beings and introverts may need more, say, recharging after socializing, but it's something that is still so, so important for everyone. We also can facilitate organizational socialization. So, as I was saying, increase opportunities for human engagement. So the virtual groups, when we're back in person, we can have focus groups, 
collaborative projects, and then reaching out to colleagues, even when it's not necessary, just checking in. And this is a good segue into our first breakout room. So this is hopefully a time where you all get to connect with each other. Um, the questions I'd like you to discuss is what would happiness in your career look like? So this is a time for you all to talk about your expertise because I know positive psychology, but you know your work and you know how to apply this. So I want you all to learn from each other and to just talk about what it would look like. Also, I'd like you to answer, how can you incorporate positive psychology practices to reach your optimal work potential and happiness? So is it gratitude? Is it thinking about how you can find some meaning? Like, how would you like to apply some of these things? All right, so we'll enter, let's see, breakout groups that are about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna do 10 minutes. Sounds good. Are you ready, Corinne? Yes. Okay. Well, that was fun. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's 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 funny. I I, I always like uh, I always like these breakout room sessions. Get get to know some new people, connect some people. Um, does anyone have any takeaway they would just throw out real quick? Was there anything that someone said during that that was really exciting? Jump in. I will jump in if not. <laughs> Well, Ken said uh, a lot of interesting things uh, in the beginning of our breakout room. And then unfortunately, the other two of us sort of over talked him uh, and he couldn't get a word <laughs> in edgewise. So Ken, uh, you know, if, bring up what you were saying, because it was certainly more insightful than everything that we filled up after you. Well, I, I definitely disagree with that. I just I kind of wish uh, we had a lot more time to, to get into it. But I basically said that uh, happiness for me after listening to a podcast recently uh, is feeling like I can be myself at work and people are going to support me for being myself and that I don't have to fit in. Uh, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been out of work since the beginning of the pandemic, so I can, I can feel uh, good thinking about this type of stuff. Whereas if I was still working and, and kind of on the grind and not, not thinking and just kind of plugged in, I don't think I would feel that way. So I just feel very fortunate to have time to think about those type of things. That's that's awesome, Ken. Now you're always insightful like that. Um, you know, Corinne, um, I want to make sure we're on time. We're going to do another breakout room in approximately ten minutes or so. So I'll, I want to get back to the uh, to the dialogue uh, for the um, for your presentation, and then we're going to do another breakout room and then uh, close out. So I'll leave it to that. Absolutely, and Ken, I really appreciate that perspective and. You know, I love that being able to just feel accepted as you are. So thank you for sharing that. All right. So I will pull up the presentation. Let's see. All right. So now we're going to shift a little bit to tending to your emotional needs because we think of positive psychology as something as, you know, we're only focusing on the positive and we think positive, 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 when really we need to step back, validate our experience, maybe use CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and be able to reframe the way that we're thinking and feeling while simultaneously validating what's happening. So I'll talk briefly about cognitive behavioral therapy. So the way this works, if we look at these diagrams, our thoughts influence our feelings, our feelings influence our behaviors, and often our behaviors can then reinforce our thoughts. So for instance, if you have the belief that I'm so bad at my job, I'm never going to progress. A feeling that could come up with that is discouraged, feeling sad, feeling unmotivated. And then what kind of behavior would that lead to? It would likely lead to a behavior of not trying to strive for something more, not working hard in your career, 
maybe avoiding because you're feeling anxious and insecure. And then that reinforces the thought because then you're not doing everything in your power to, you know, excel and do your best in your career. So what we do is we want to throw a wrench in this whole system by changing our behavior. So what we do is we would change our behavior as pushing ourselves to excel in this specific um, realm. So if you're having the thought, I'm no good at my job and I'm not going to excel, maybe apply for that job that is something that will challenge you, that scares you, and really step outside of your comfort zone. And then you might be surprised by what happens. And if you end up getting this great opportunity, it can then reinforce the thought that you are um, good at your job, that you actually do a decent job. So we'll briefly go over, go over the cognitive distortions. So I'll pick out some important ones. So we can have different distortions about how we think and feel. So all or nothing thinking. This is one that we probably all have done at some point, right? If I'm not a success, I'm a failure. This can be black and white thinking. I either do it all right or it's all wrong. You can also go back and look at these because we need to get into our next breakout room soon, but I'll go over a couple more. A mental filter. This is pretty much like I was talking about earlier with the negativity bias. So over-focusing on the negative rather than really looking at the positive. So we magnify the negative and minimize the positive. So at work, say you have 10 successes and one failure. What do we focus on more? Do you look at the successes and say, wow, I was so proud of myself for all of these successes and I was incredibly happy about those? Or do we think about the one failure, inflate that, magnify that, and say, I can't believe I did so poorly and this is so horrible, right? So becoming aware of these different kinds of cognitive distortions, we can then help ourselves reframe. So how do you think you could have distortions in the workplace about colleagues, bosses, clients? Maybe there's a way that you communicate that's being impacted by this. For instance, consumers that you work with, do you think they're all lazy, they're jerks, they're incompetent? Do you have these thoughts about your boss? What could possibly be an alternative thought to these? I know we all have negative thoughts sometimes and it does impact the way that we feel. So an alternative thought could be giving them the benefit of the doubt, right? Oh, maybe this person is facing a real hardship. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe they have a mental illness. Maybe my boss is just having a really bad day. Like I hope he's doing okay, or I hope she's doing okay. If you choose this perspective, it does help your well-being, productivity, and happiness. Because really all we have is our perspective the perspective we take and the actions we take every single day. And that's going to influence our overall well-being at work. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, this is just a simple way to try to challenge the distortions we have. So first you wanna identify the belief as a cognitive distortion. So how about some all or nothing thinking? Um, I did poorly on an assignment, therefore I'm a complete failure and everything is bad. Then we gather evidence to contradict that belief. Okay, how many times have I actually done well in this? Collect all those times where you did really well in a project, you worked really well with your colleagues, build that evidence up, build up what's real. Because a lot of times these are distortions and not the reality when we don't feel like enough. Then we challenge it through behavior change, like I said, do the thing that scares you. Even if you feel like this is overwhelming and I don't feel good enough for this, push through it and challenge yourself. Use positive, rational self-talk, saying, I am good enough. I am good at my job. Just because I failed one time does not mean I myself am a failure. Keeping a thought log of these kinds of things can be helpful too. So keeping a thought log of when you have a distortion and then how you can reframe that. And just don't forget the evidence because the evidence is there that you are competent and you do a good job and you're a great leader. But it's important to remember that and to remind yourself. So the next question is a true or false question about cognitive behavioral therapy. 
So cognitive behavioral therapy is an evidence-based intervention for changing distorted thoughts or behavior, or through behavior, sorry. So we'll give you about 30 seconds for this one. All right, so good. So it looks like a lot of you understand what cognitive behavioral therapy is. And this is something, as I said earlier, it's not just something we use in the therapy world. Every single person can use this and you don't need to have a therapist to use this. You can challenge your distorted thoughts just through conscious action and paying to attention to what the reality is. The next part is managing psychological projection and displacement. So some of you may have heard of what it's like to project or displace your feelings onto someone else. So for instance, if you come to the workplace already in a bad mood, already not feeling well, how is that going to influence the way that you speak with your colleagues, your bosses, your coworkers? First, you want to notice your patterns. Do you have a pattern of getting angry when someone uh, criticizes you? Do you have a pattern of getting angry maybe with constructive criticism? Validate your feelings. Say, it's okay to feel this right now. I'm feeling stressed out. I'm feeling insecure. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Then regulate your emotional reaction. So I'm going to give you some tools that can help you regulate your emotional reaction and help you cope with whatever it is that's coming up so that we can get to that place of more positivity. Then change your habitual behavior. So I like this example of like being on a work call and how do you know that you're starting to feel tense? Is your chest getting hot? Are you getting tense? Is your head starting to pound a little bit? So notice these warning signs in yourself. Validate, it's okay. It's okay to feel angry sometimes because everyone does. Then you can use your coping skills to calm yourself. And instead of snapping at the consumer, you can come at this with more understanding. And ultimately, if you can regulate your emotional state through validation and coping skills, you can be more productive and then you can choose to have the positive perspective. Emotional regulation, a lot of things go into this. So when we think about emotional regulation, we don't often think about all of the different actions we take to have a calm mind. So I like to use the PLEASE acronym, which involves treating physical illnesses. So if you're sick, go to the doctor. Eating healthy, so getting good nutrition. How do you feel on mornings when you're living off of just coffee or versus having a good breakfast? Avoid mood-altering drugs. So I know we all probably drink coffee, but trying to keep that to maybe a minimum or maybe not too excess because it's something that can make us more anxious, agitated, angry. So just being mindful of how much coffee we're drinking. Sleep well, get enough sleep. I know there's a lot of pressure in this really intense culture of working and high achieving, but make sure you set time aside to get enough sleep and exercise. Exercise is a huge one. So getting enough exercise can allow us to be calmer, more present, more grounded. And then we can speak with our employees with more compassion. We can think clearer and just make us a better worker. I also find opposite action as an emotional regulation skill to be very useful. So this is when you're feeling a really strong negative emotion, it's essentially acting in the exact opposite way than you would expect. So if you're feeling angry, talk with a soft voice move slowly, speak with kindness. And this actually changes your internal state for you to be able to start feeling more calm yourself. So the next question is, all of the following could aid in emotional regulation except going for a morning run, sleeping eight hours per night, meditating daily, or drinking excessive coffee. So it's looking like it's looking like people know that coffee is not going to help. <laughs> and 
And this is why I put excessive coffee, because if we have too much caffeine, that's going to be detrimental. But if we have, say, a good amount of coffee, maybe that'll make us alert enough and <laughs> awake enough. All right, good job, everyone. So here's a list of some quick grounding and coping techniques. Because if we want to be more productive and more happy, we need to take care of ourselves. So if we're feeling just super stressed, there's too much on our plate, there's too many moving parts, this list is something that you can refer to if you're feeling just overwhelmed and don't know how to manage it. So eating a strong mint or gum or smelling a strong, pleasant fragrance. So this is sensory grounding, really focusing on the smell, focusing on the taste. And it's something that actually really grounds you in the present moment and you don't have to do much, right? You can be sitting at your desk feeling really stressed out, grab a mint put on some scented lotion, and it's something that can be incredibly grounding. Splash cool water on your face, a classic one. It can cool you down, calm you down. It reduces your vagal tone, so it can reduce your heart rate. Drink water, stretch your body. Go for a walk. Go for a walk is a huge one. I would say if you're feeling really stressed at work, if you can walk around the office a few times, walk to the water cooler. Since we're at home right now, go walk your dog. Whatever it is, just get your body moving to get out of your head. Get into nature. If you can walk a little bit in a park for a couple minutes, go do that. Progressive muscle relaxation therapy. This is something that we're going to practice in just a minute, so I'll guide you through that to give it a try. Box breathing is something where we, can, we don't have time to practice this one today, but there is a link on the bottom right where we can learn about box breathing. Guided meditation helps with calmness. And using healthy distractions, calling a friend, watching comedy, doing something that's funny, right? Distractions can be helpful as long as we're not suppressing our emotional state. Phrases you can say to yourself if you're having a hard time. It's okay to feel this and this will pass. All right, so now I'd like to do a quick practice of the mushy gushy loving kindness meditation which I promise is research backed, empirically supported and a wonderful thing to do. And then progressive muscle relaxation therapy. So this will take a couple minutes and then we'll talk about goal setting and then we'll go into another breakout group. All right, so we'll start with the loving kindness meditation. So everyone bear with me, it's touchy feely. Everyone just kind of shake off, you know, any closed mindedness that might be there. So I'd like you all to just get comfortable in your seat. Sit however you feel comfortable with your feet on the floor. And if you feel comfortable to do so, you can close your eyes. And if you'd like to turn off your camera while you're meditating and feel more comfortable, you can do that. So whatever, whatever you feel. So you can begin by sitting down in a comfortable position, closing your eyes. Sit with your back erect, without being strained or overarched. Take a few deep breaths, relax your body. Feel your energy settle into your body and into the moment. Classical phrases are things like, may I live in safety? May I be happy? May I be healthy? May I live with ease? You can gently repeat these phrases over and over again. Have your mind rest in the phrases. And whenever you find your attention has wandered, don't worry about it. When you recognize you've lost touch with the moment, see if you can gently let go and begin again. May I live in safety, be happy. Be healthy, live with ease. Call to mind somebody that you care about, a good friend or someone who's helped you in your life, someone who inspires you. You can visualize them and say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and then direct the phrases of loving kindness to them. 
may you live in safety. Be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Call to mind someone you know who's having a difficult time right now. They've experienced a loss, a painful feeling, a difficult situation. If somebody like that comes to mind, bring them here. Imagine them sitting in front of you. Say their name. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you live in safety. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. Think of someone who plays some role in your life, some function you don't know well, that you don't have a particular feeling for. Maybe it's a checkout person at the supermarket. If someone like that comes to mind, imagine them sitting in front of you and offer the same phrases of loving kindness to them. May you live in safety. Be happy, be healthy, live with ease. We connect into these phrases, aiming the heart in this way. We're opening ourselves to the possibility of including rather than excluding. And ultimately, we open in this way to all beings everywhere. May all beings live in safety, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. You feel the energy of this aspiration extending infinitely in front of you to either side. And as the heart extends in a boundless way, leaving no one out, may all beings live in safety, be happy, be healthy and live with ease. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes and see if you can bring this energy with you throughout the day. So how is everyone feeling after that? If anyone wants to chime in. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrific yeah I feel calmer even reading it <laughs> <laughs> wonderful well, I hope you all feel grounded and maybe connected to others and now we'll do a, a very quick progressive muscle relaxation therapy which is another relaxation tool that's a little less um, ooey gooey mushy touchy feely so <laughs> what you want to do is start by tensing your feet so tense your feet and pull them up towards the sky. Keep tensing and relax. Now I'd like you to tense your legs and tense, tense your calves, your hamstrings, tense as much as you can and relax. Next, I'd like you to tense your stomach muscles, which is a place we hold a lot of emotions. So tense your stomach really tight. Keep breathing while you're tensing your stomach and relax. And then I'd like you to take both of your arms and make two fists and then tense your arms fists and shoulders at the same time. Move your shoulders up towards your, your ears. Create tension and relax. And finally, I'd like you to tense your neck, head and face at the same time. So it might kind of look like you ate something sour. So tense, everyone look funny <laughs> and relax. All right. And that's progressive muscle relaxation. And it's something that can be used every day to just reduce tension in your body and help you enter the world the way you want to.
So we'll quickly talk about SMART goals and then we'll go into our next breakout group. So SMART goals are goals that we set that are very specific, measurable, achievable, and realistic and time bound. So what I would like you all to do is to set some SMART goals for yourself. So when it comes to positive psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy, I want you to be able to set some goals for yourself and commit to say one or two goals. So an example would be, I will run for 45 minutes three times per week for the next month. So this one will help with emotional regulation. Another example, I will meditate daily for 10 minutes for the next two weeks. Even five minutes of daily meditation can actually make a huge impact too. So it doesn't even have to take up 10 minutes. Another example, I will attend therapy weekly for the next three months. And as a therapist, I always recommend therapy for everyone because I think it's something that you don't have to have some horrible pathology or horrible life event happening to benefit from having a compassionate ear. Some psychological skills and the positive psychological skills we can use could be say, using the three good things at the end of each workday. Maybe implementing the three good things into uh, work meetings, giving shout outs to people at work, implementing that into your strategy for coaching and you know, creating an environment of inclusivity and happiness. And another example, I will practice mindfulness while at the workplace through paying attention to my thoughts, feelings, sensations, and behavior. I will pay attention to my experience with kindness towards myself. I think the kindness part is very important, that we want to pay attention to what's happening and we want to be kind to ourselves. All right. I plan to implement a SMART goal that incorporates, so this is your next question, physical activity, mindfulness and or meditation, a gratitude practice, or something else. Hey, Corinne, I'm going to put in the chat um, the Arundel Psychological Associates website, too. And, you know, if ever, if ever anyone needs um, different uh, psychology services, um, it's a great, great practice and great people. Um, I'll let you tell a little bit about that, too, um, if you like. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I am so fortunate to work at Arundel Psychological Associates because it's, it's a group of such just honestly incredible people that I just feel fortunate to even be around and they're not my therapists, but I think it's a place of just inclusivity, kindness, and a lot of expertise and skill. So, you know, if you do need some help, it's a really good resource. And, you know, we're always open to helping people and, you know, that, that's why we got into this. All right, so it looks like we've got some physical activity goals. We've got some mindfulness and meditation goals. We've got a few psychological skills goals and some something else. And I'm curious to hear what the something else ones are. So maybe we'll, we'll talk about those in the chat. All right, so here's breakout room two. So let's hear what you have to say. Using CBT skills, I'm asking what are some cognitive distortions you have about colleagues, bosses, clients, and maybe even yourself? How do these affect your communication and your productivity? And what are some alternative thoughts and alternative behaviors? So that's kind of the first part. Second part being, what are the SMART goals you'd like to create? So just sharing like, I'm going to meditate every day or et cetera. All right, so let's go into those breakout groups. Are you ready, Corinne? Yes, I am, thank you. Okay, thank you. Coming down to the final, final hour or final minute. Um, 
I hope everyone found this to be helpful and um, a good event. Um, I think we're still trickling people in from the breakout rooms. But, um, you know, I think it was a, a morning well spent. And, you know, thank you to FEI and Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan in Baltimore. Um, keep this in mind. We always do these events for free. And um, one thing, you know, I'm always trying to do is get more people involved with Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan in Baltimore. Um, please, if you found any um, connection with this event or if you got any um, if you got anything out of it today, please think about making a donation. Um, you know, it's the Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan in Baltimore, which is the the Baltimore City chapter, which we're doing great work and hit, hit major strides. Um, I'm glad we had a, a couple different people from Boys and Girls Club of Metropolitan Baltimore on the call, as well as some board members. But please think about donating to us if you um, you got enjoyment out of this this um, event. And then um, FEI is doing another great um, networking event like this, similar. Um, it's going to be on March 25th. And it's going to be Oliver Brewing, uh, which is the, the, it's the ownership group of like Pratt Street Ale House, Columbia Ale House. It's their beer. We're going to do, a, I believe, a three beer tasting. They're going to talk about how they created their brewery and business. And we're going to enjoy some beer right after St. Patrick's Day, which hopefully everyone can uh, enjoy that. But um, that'll be March 25th with FEI. Um, thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Corinne, any final comments before we, we run out? Well, I am just so grateful for the opportunity to be here. And, you know, I appreciate you, FEI, the Boys and Girls Club. I appreciate you for putting this all together. And it's been just a really exciting morning to connect with some just really brilliant people who are already incorporating practices like this into their work. Um, so I'm just, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And I, I hope you all are able to take something away from this that, you know, helps you have a work life that feels more happy and fulfilling. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you guys. Denise, thank you for your efforts and Jesse for being organized with us. Um, stay in touch and uh, I'll, I'll be sure to get all this information over to everyone. We're gonna, Corinne was nice enough to say she, we could provide the slides as well as we're recording this. If you guys ever want to take away anything from it. Um, I love just being able to combine networking and, and great ideas. And Corinne, thank you so much for being able to just go through a couple quick concepts. I think there's a lot of really good takeaways. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, everyone have a great rest of the day and weekend and uh, be safe. And, and thank you so much. Take care. Thank, thank you, you guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>